So that's all of the run up uh, to this. And let me just say a few words briefly about our keynote speaker, Michael Roberts, uh, this afternoon. Uh, I won't give you his full bio. You could find that on the website. But I did want to say a few words about why I'm so excited about why Michael's here for today. So uh, Michael, as, as many of you will well know, is a, a real pioneer uh, in the field of food law and policy, uh, not only in the US, but around the world. Um, and um, uh, we're just thrilled that he's here uh, to give us his insight and to share his perspective uh, on both this emerging field in the Canadian context um, and what uh, has been going on uh, elsewhere and some of the history there. So Michael is the founding director, uh, executive director of the new Resnick uh, Food, uh, Resnick Program for Food Law and Policy at the UCLA School of Law. Um, I think uh, uh, a new policy institute that, uh, and law and policy institute that's going to be a real model for uh, many of those, uh, those of us who are interested in thinking about how to build that kind of institutional capacity uh, elsewhere. And Michael has an immense depth of experience, as you'll be able to tell from his bio or, or well know already, uh, as a food law researcher, a writer, he's an author of several books, as a teacher, a practitioner, uh, advisor. It's hard to imagine something that Michael hasn't done or been involved in in the field of food law and policy. Uh, and so uh, I think it's so crucial for us as we're thinking forward about building this discipline in Canada. Uh, we have some crucial questions ahead of us, right? Which perspectives and values to include? Uh, which ideas and interests are likely to get privileged? Others that are likely to get more marginalized? How do we wade through these uh, things, these, these issues, um, these questions going forward as we think about what the best way to build up uh, this as either a field, a discipline, or a connected uh, subject matter in Canada uh, and linked to what's going on elsewhere? We rarely, I think, have an opportunity to make those kinds of choices uh, when we think about defining a field, and this is a pretty exciting opportunity to do that. Okay, so I probably said too much already. Uh, you're really here to hear Michael, and uh, I'll turn things over to him. Uh, let's give him a big round of applause to start out. Thanks very much. For Thank you, Jamie, for that very generous introduction. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, it's a little colder here than I'm accustomed to at UCLA. Um, I was amazed to show up at the airport seeing people wear shorts. I thought, uh, it's a lot colder here than, than I'm used to wearing shorts. In Los Angeles, when it dips below 70 degrees, you see the scarves and the coats come out because we like to change our clothing once in a while. Um, I'm also grateful to be here uh, because uh, I'm looking for a job just in case uh, he who shall not be named is voted president <laughs> in three days. So let me know if you know of anything. Um, but uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, I broke the first cardinal rule of not injecting politics in the first few minutes of your talk, but so it is. Um, if I can uh, uh, perhaps indicate the excitement around food law by just telling you what's going on in the last 30 days of my life. Uh, I've, we, um, a couple of weeks ago, I went to uh, Beijing, China. Uh, we had uh, a workshop there that I participated in and a series of projects that our program at UCLA has been involved in uh, over the last year. I've actually been teaching food law in China now for almost a decade. Uh, at Reming University Law School, which is China's top-ranked law school, they now have a food law program. Uh, Shanghai, uh, there is a law school in Shanghai. It's a smaller uh, law school, but part of a ma major national university, East China University of Science and Technology. They have a food law program. And there are students who are actually graduating now with an emphasis in food law. Uh, when I first started teaching in China, uh, I had maybe a dozen students attend the course. Uh, they were curious to see, to, to learn a little bit, to, to better their English. Now there's over 200 students that attend these courses because they're really interested and concerned about their food supply. Starting with food safety for good reason, but then moving to other issues that have been discussed in, 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 uh, yesterday in today's conference. Then after returning from China, literally two days later, we had our third annual UCLA Harvard Food Law Conference uh, in Los Angeles at our law school. Uh, Harvard Food Law Lab started shortly after we started our program at UCLA. And this is our third annual conference. We have a memorandum of understanding. We work together on various projects, kind of a, a bi-coastal uh, exchange. Uh, this conference, we addressed the, food, uh, the regulation of food marketing to children and had a robust discussion amongst scientists. We had a science panel. 
a law panel addressing uh, interesting constitutional issues of free speech, and then that followed a policy panel. Uh, and our, our strong belief is that this intersectional or interdisciplinary approach of science, law, and policy is the right course to take. Um, then I headed up to San Francisco a few days later for a food and addiction conference that held at the University of California, San Francisco uh, Medical School, uh, where there's a, a lot of research going on with respect to food addiction, specifically on sugar. Uh, that led to an interview with a newspaper uh, and an article that I co-authored you know, literally less than eight hours with the help of my fellow on uh, this scandal uh, at Harvard University that's been reported in the newspapers where researchers were paid off years ago uh, to redirect attention from sugar to fat. And uh, it, it's been a really interesting development to watch. As you know, we have a rich, uh, a rich um, heritage in the, in the U.S. on litiga uh, class action litigation. We're always thinking in those terms. Uh, and so uh, the question was posed is whether or not this scandal could lead to further lawsuits against the sugary beverage industry. Um, I then uh, leave in two weeks to Italy, uh, to uh, where I've been teaching for a number of years at the University of Tuscia, which is in Verterbo, just outside of Rome. And this conference uh, is, is a commemoration of a European food law treatise that's been put together that I contributed a chapter. Uh, food law in Italy uh, in other areas of Europe is really taking off and it's interesting to watch. Uh, I lectured in Milan University uh, last year twice actually. So this is just a sample. Uh, it's a really busy 30 days <laughs> and here I am in Canada. Uh, and what you're doing here is marvelous and it's part, so I, I wanted to convey to you at least at the beginning that you're part of a larger movement. This is a global movement uh, of food, uh, revolving around food law and policy. Uh, and it's really, really fun to watch. Uh, there was a, uh, a, a uh, program that just started in Milan called F the Italian Food Law and Policy Center. And uh, I met them recently in New York and I asked them, well, you, you, got, you have the same name that we have at UCLA. I said, what was, what was your thinking? And the director said, well, I heard you speak in Spain a couple years ago, and I just liked your name, so we ended up using it. <laughs> so I don't mind that. If you want to set up a food law and policy center here, uh, that's perfectly okay with me. Uh, but I thought I'd, uh, falling into food law has been an interesting journey for me, and I thought I'd personalize it for just a minute, because uh, as Jamie mentioned, I, I am a little bit of a pioneer, but it's largely by accident and then just pure stubbornness and, and, uh, and, and sort of staying the course. But I, uh, I've been in food law both as an academic and as a practitioner now for uh, about 16 years. And some, uh, at, at the start, I was sitting in my law office, bored to death actually, to tell you the truth. And I knew I needed to change my career. And uh, I picked up an article and read in the Harvard Business Journal about the future of food. I had grown up on a small farm. My father was a produce broker. And I thought, this is interesting. This is what I want to do. And so I ended up uh, making a long story short, navigating my way into food law. And I remember the president of my law firm who thought I had lost it uh, and even offered me professional counseling when I told him that I was entering into this field, uh, said to me, uh, Michael, what are you doing? Agriculture and food are dead. Nobody talks about it anymore. He called me about three or four years ago and said, how did you know? <laughs> Every time I pick up a newspaper, there's an article about food. My response was, so sometimes it's better to be lucky than smart. I had no idea that what I was entering into would someday be a movement. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I, I've made my way into a, a favorable position at UCLA and, and last year, or this year, actually published a food law treatise, the first of its kind. Uh, food law in the United States is a copy of it out on the table uh, with a nifty flyer if you're interested. But one of the questions that I've asked myself many, many times is what is food law? What is food law and policy? In fact, when I taught the first food law and policy class in Arkansas, Fayetteville, Arkansas, where I was on the law faculty, uh, where Bill and Hillary Clinton used to teach, uh, I, I remember staying up all night long, worried that a student would ask me, well, professor, what is food law and policy? Because I really wasn't sure. 
And, and we began teaching and experimenting and thinking about this, this field and what it means and what it's all about. And it has uh, led to some interesting um, uh, dimensions. Uh, and it's also occurred to me recently, I'm very excited that I'll be teaching a class in the spring on the history of food law, even going back before uh, the United States. Um, and, and looking at the past of food law all the way back to Judaic code, uh, which is a really interesting um, uh, set of laws and regulations, albeit they're a part of a religious code, uh, regulating food in a really interesting way. Uh, and then even to the Middle Ages, where we, we talk about sumptuary laws that regulated class, food, uh, class, class divisions via food regulation. Uh, and even to uh, uh, later on in the Middle Ages, where we regulated the quality of food, concerned about food fraud and economic adulteration, as we call it today. And then, of course, to, uh, into the Industrial Revolution, which led to... Uh, uh, producing food in some interesting and unique ways that have led to this modern food system. And so the history of food law is sometimes longer than we think it is. Uh, and I think that's uh, very, very interesting to think about. Um, in fact, in the United States, we usually benchmark uh, the first of two modern federal food laws in 1906, which is when we first had the Federal uh, Pure Food and Drug Act. Uh, and then the, uh, the uh, Food uh, Federal uh, Meat Inspection Act uh, at, on the same year. Now, um, at that time, uh, food fraud was rampant, and uh, it was um, led largely by uh, a man named Upton Sinclair, who wrote the book Jungle. And I know that many of you have read that book, either by design or uh, against your free will while you were in school. But it's a, a fascinating book, uh, and Upton Sinclair is very famous for saying, I aimed at the public's heart and by accident hit it in the stomach. Uh, and at that time, it created a real outcry uh, amongst the public about the conditions in the meat factories, uh, particularly in Chicago. But it's, it's interesting to, to, to read back at that time, and there's a lot of echoes. Uh, at that time in the 19th century, we had a changing agrarian system. Sound familiar? <laughs> uh, and there were concerns over this, this adulteration in food uh, actually um, reflected larger societal issues about trust and changing moral codes. There was concern, and was, there's was quite a bit written about it, about this disconnect between consumers and producers. Again, sound familiar? Karen Haltonen, who is a cultural historian, noted this distancing shift, a crisis of authenticity and confidence. And purity became the, the, the byword. And there were a number of legal milestones even prior to the 1906 Act. And I illustrate these to you just by way of reference that we're trying to figure this out. Uh, and there were a number of different acts and bills that were proposed. But this idea of purity, this idea of connection, uh, and, and, and how it finally led to the 1906 law is really, really interesting. Uh, there was a great quote uh, uh, in reference to the Paddock Bill in 1892 by Senator Paddock himself. The devil has got hold of the food supply of this country. Uh, and it sounds a little odd in its reference to the devil, but it's something that uh, probably many uh, espouse as well today. Uh, it's also interesting to see who was involved in cleaning up the food supply. But the Good Housekeeping magazine was very much involved in this, in this cleaning up of the food supply system uh, in the early 20th century. Um, huh. The uh, Housewife, Housewives Alliance, I love this slide, demands proper inspection of meat. Now this sounds like something that Michael Pollan lifted. Uh, from their banner, eat no, eat no meat, buy no meat, eat fresh vegetables. So it's really, an, sometimes we think we're starting something new, <laughs> when in fact there's an interesting patterns that are at hand. Um, but the legacy of these acts, that it changed forever the, the traditional constitutional understanding in the United States at least, that public uh, health and safety was the province of the states. And that was really a very, very important development. What was also interesting about that act, again, another echo, 
was that it, it actually had the support of businesses. Why? Well, trade was at stake. No different than the passage in the United States a few years ago of the Food Safety Modernization Act, known as FISMA. The business community was in support, remarkably bipartisan support in the Obama administration for a major act. Again, why? Trade, is, trade was at stake. And it also illustrates a consumer political force. What we think about food as consumers uh, has a role in moving forward political uh, movements in food. And finally, what I think is really interesting is the role of literature. Uh, there is a great deal of writing that goes on in food, uh, every, from, from Upton Sinclair to writing that was occurring during the passage of the 1938 uh, Act in the United States as well as more recently, uh, global writers such as Michael Pollan, uh, Mark Bittman from the New York Times, and others. What I also think is really interesting are these moralistic tendencies that seep into uh, food law. And I know this probably drives people like Michael Tannenbaum crazy, who spoke uh, earlier in the animal law conference. But it's really interesting to think about this in terms of contextualizing law and its role. But Pure. What does the word pure mean? Well, it, it's the absence of bad stuff, but it also has an older meaning, uh, as, uh, as noted by uh, uh, Wiley, who is a, a great leader in this movement to the House Committee, and you can read that for yourself on the screen. But one of the questions that it raises is, is, is this assertion of moral values. Uh, does it lead to an oversimplification of complex issues uh, and unrealistic expectations? And that's why I go back to the Judaic code, which I think is really interesting in terms of looking at the past, where the Jewish dietary laws have, have often were thought about being about hygiene and purity. And Mary Douglas, the great anthropologist uh, who's noted for her work on purity and danger, um, noted that, that the food taboos not accounted for by medicine or science. In other words, the, this purity concept was about setting a people apart. And it had something to do with cultural aspirations and, and creating a unity within a group. It's interesting to note that kosher itself is the second fastest growing label in the United States. Gluten-free is number one. Speaking of which, looking at the moral implications of, moral, uh, of uh, purity and the gluten lie, which is a book written by Alan Levenovitz, a book that I disagree with on many, many accounts, but he does at least frame an interesting question. And that is why people put moral and religious lenses on food terminology, reducing issues to scientific and, and the this, this scientific and moral tension. But what we have here is, a, is regardless of how we think about the history and, and how it's developed, which is all really interesting, and I wish I could have more time to talk to you about it, but we have a food movement. And, and this food movement was articulated by Michael Pollan, and I think it's interesting to note what he states. It would be a mistake to conclude that the food movement's agenda can be reduced to a set of laws, policies, and regulations, important as these may be. The food movement is about community, identity, pleasure, most notably about carving out a new social and economic space removed from the influence of big corporations on the one side and government on the other. And I would add to Michael that it's also about food justice, equity, and looking at ways of, of bringing everyone in the community together. So we have new norms. As I mentioned in my treatise, in essence, the food movement has set out to foster new norms for civil society. And this, these new norms are what are leading to interesting laws and regulations that are then uh, developed in order to meet uh, these norms. Um, and certainly, uh, there has been no shortage of news articles. Uh, these are all uh, from uh, the US uh, and I know that you've seen the same sort of headline stories uh, here in Canada, as well as uh, food litigation. Issues and headlines of obesity and nutrition. And finally, food equity and access. 
and not to leave out climate change and environment. Urban agriculture. Sounds a little messy, doesn't it? Lawrence Friedman, who is a law professor at Stanford University, has written a book on the history of American law. And it was actually in reading this book that it really became clear to me as to what is food law in, place, in, in its place in uh, modern law. When he wrote that modern law mirrors society and moves with its time so that it is always new. And, it, and, and to me, food law and policy is the adaptation of law to modern food systems and to consumers. It provides, it's new, it's provocative, and, it, and this adaptation requires new rules and fresh ideas. It also leads to controversies because the modern food system and the interest of consumers and others are not always in sync. In other words, the goal is not always definitive. So we have a number of divisive issues. To name a few, GMO labeling, backyard chickens, sugar-added beverages, the word natural, which has led to hundreds of class action lawsuits in California and elsewhere in the United States. So going now to the beginning, which is where we always should start as lawyers or people who think about law, what is the definition of food law? Well. This is how I define it. Now that I've thought about it over the years, I've come up with a very sophisticated definition. A little bit of this and a little bit of that. I say this because food law is multidoctrinal. I always ask my students at UCLA in, in the class that I teach, and it's an introduction to food law and policy course. And by the way, to illustrate again this great growth, three years ago, 10 students. Today, 45 students. And, and these students are not all going to become food law lawyers. I tell them I want you to become good food citizens and good leaders in your food communities because they're all going to be eaters. Many of them will have children who eat and many of them will have friends and family who eat. And so we're all in the same boat, so to speak. But I always tell my students, you take any class you have at law school and, and my students write papers. Uh, in class, and, and, and it allows them to focus on an area where they have an interest. You take any class in law school, and we'll find a connection to food. And if you look at this list, it covers about most, if not all, the classes you might see in a law school curriculum. And all these pieces are found in food law. Administrative law, international law, of course, trade. Who's heard of Codex Aliment Alimentarius Commission, the FAO? Uh, the World Trade Organization, and all of the many complex rules around the SPS agreement and the TBT agreements. Uh, environmental law is a big part of food law. When we talk about environmental issues from, uh, from water to, to air uh, to, uh, to the soil. Uh, health law, uh, another obvious uh, link uh, when we deal with issues of, of obesity and malnutrition. Torts. Uh, again, litigation is on the rise in many ways, uh, one through food law, in addition to labeling, also uh, sa safety. Constitutional law, First Amendment issues, uh, issues of intellectual property uh, are really big in food law when we deal with geographical indicators, for example, which divides, which goes, goes back to international law when we deal with the differences between Europe and the United States. Um, real property, when we deal with urban agricultural issues. Real property becomes an issue when we deal with zoning issues. Uh, water law, you can't have food without water, becomes really important. Uh, based on what I saw yesterday, you seem to have a lot of water here. In LA, that's a big issue. Uh, and so uh, these are difficult uh, issues to sometimes address. Animal law, uh, which is uh, always a really interesting intersectional point with food law. And, if, and then finally, civil rights. On our board, we have a, 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 one of the leaders in Los Angeles on our, our board for our program at UCLA, uh, we have an outside advisory board, we have a leader in the civil rights movement in Los Angeles who's very interested in food equity. And so it's something we think about a, a lot. Uh, 
So when we frame food law with all of these pieces, this multidoctrinal approach, there's a lot of different ways to organize uh, food law. And one way of framing it is through topical phases that provides a historical framework. And this accepts Friedman's notion that, that modern law adapts to social change. And, and so uh, that's what I elected to do, for example, in the treatise and the way I teach, is that every, each, of, and each of these phases evolves in response to problems and challenges. They're sequential and cumulative, so they build on each other, but they're also distinctive. So the first phase is commerce. Uh, food is core to commercial activity and has been for a long, long time. The earliest laws, as I referenced earlier, or previously, were intended to preserve the integrity of food and to promote trade. Uh, food fraud, as we call to, in today's parlance, at least in the United States, economically motivated adulteration is a big part of this, as well as trade. We then move to safety. Now, bacteria uh, uh, has had a relationship to food, really, that got started in the late 19th century. And many of these problems of food safety have to do with discoveries and inventions that increase the complexity of food. What is food? And, and one of the funnest things we do in our class is try to define food. If you look at the definition, at least in the US FDA, they define food by calling it food, uh, a very, uh, very interesting definition. But they also include a second prong to that definition, chewing gum. Now, why would chewing gum be called out as food? Well, at that time in Congress, there was a great debate about whether confectionaries were food. And so you take the lowest form of confectionaries, which is chewing gum, you insert it in the food, you make a statement that candy is food. So what we think about food and the composition of food uh, is, is uh, really interesting, and it can become more complex. Today, we've moved on beyond, beyond candy, haven't we? We're into second generation of GMOs and nanotechnology, which could, it will, will make GMO pale by comparison in terms of what it can do to the composition of food. Uh, earlier that was mentioned in the, in the previous session uh, on Beyond Meat, uh, a, a, a plant-based meat su a substitute for meat that tastes and looks like meat. Uh, the CEO of the company recently came to my class and talked about this journey he's had uh, in, in, in introducing this vegan-based vegan product as a meat substitute. But all of these issues uh, increase the complexities of regulating the safety of food. Uh, marketing, uh, which is both the labeling and the advertising. The, the marketing of food uh, is really astonishing, and it's remarkable how much legal work this has generated for lawyers, at least in the United States uh, and worldwide. Um, but it also, it's, it's the rise of the brand name. I've often said that in the world of food, there, it, it, the laws are made by people who have power. We all know that, right? It's an obvious statement. And I ask the question, who has power in food? Well, having grown up on a farm, I can tell you that farmers have never had any power at all. The manufacturers have had power for a number of years, but there's a shift that's occurring, at least in the United States, that's really, really interesting, and that's the rise of the retailer. There's a consolidation in retail around the world that's fascinating to watch. So we're not competing so much on price anymore, we're competing on value. And so you see retailers now engaging in private contracts through the supply chain that are regulating food and even the treatment of animals in ways that we never could foresee. And it's a fascinating development and one that evokes a number of interesting legal questions and legal issues that are really now contractual in nature rather than regulatory in nature, uh, which, which, uh, uh, which uh, raises a, a completely different dynamic in the regulation of food. In the world, uh, the fourth area, uh, Am I counting that correctly? Yes. Uh, nutrition, which really got its rise in the 1960s, and it involves the regulation of dietary supplements, a very big industry and a very interesting industry, to nutrition labeling, to legal responses to malnutrition and obesity. And it, it calls into play a number of policies and initiatives, and a very complicated debate about personal responsibility and regulatory action. 
And in, in the United States, in New York, for example, the portion size of soda was a really hot issue in New York City a few years ago. And, and the law that was passed by the city was, uh, by Mayor Bloomberg, was actually struck down by the, New York, the highest court in New York. Um, and, and menu labeling and the taxing of junk food and, and all of these issues evoke this debate about personal responsibility. Uh, some years ago, there was uh, litigation uh, in a very interesting case, Pelman versus McDonald's. And at, at the plaintiff was a young African male living in New York City, and the lawsuit was brought in his name, Pelman, and a number of other uh, uh, children were added as part, as part, were attempted to be added as part of the class. The lawsuit was brought against McDonald's for causing their obesity. Now, my students are now are too young to remember this case, but at the time, it led to an outcry in radio uh, networks across the country and in uh, political debates. And the, the problem people had was, we're making McDonald's responsible for the, the obesity of children? Now, to you and me today, we may say, yeah. But at that time, it was a foreign concept. It was new. And every editorial of newspapers across the country denounced this lawsuit as another example of ambulance chasing lawyers trying to make a buck. What was interesting is that it is the evidence that came through because of this case showed that there was a connection between eating fast food and obesity. And sometimes you lose the battle and win the war. In that case, this, this class action was never certified. A few years ago, the, the, the case was finally dismissed for the last time and after a number of different appeals on, on different motion issues. But McDonald's changed its nutrition advertisements. It changed its billboard advertising. And it was an interesting case uh, as it pitted against, again, personal responsibility versus uh, um, um, uh, corporate responsibility or business responsibility. And we see this being played out over and over and over again. At our conference we held at UCLA recently, Another interesting uh, case, years ago, the, Fed, the uh, Federal Trade Commission, known as the FTC in, in the United States, uh, wanted to regulate the advertising of sugar to children. And the reason wasn't obesity. It had to do with teeth, with dental care. And, uh, and again, there was a public outcry. Every major newspaper, including the Washington Post, the New York Times, and others, took the FTC to task. And it's really interesting to go, to go back and to read these editorials. And that's where the phrase, the nanny state, first came to play. And the, the accusations of the FTC trying to create a nanny state uh, became part of the debate. And the FTC had its regulatory wings clipped. It lost part of its regulatory authority. And it still has not been restored. It's interesting to note that in the United States, the FTC has more authority to regulate the advertisement of food to adults than it does to children. And so it's a, it's a fascinating debate as we see this play out. I love engaging in this, argue, in this discussion with my students about the concepts of personal responsibility versus uh, corporate responsibility. But a lot of that, uh, the, we frame it that way because that's the way the debate comes out in this issue of nutrition. And then finally, and maybe even most importantly, uh, food systems. And this is the last section actually in my treatise. And I think this is, this is, in many respects, this is what draws a lot of people into uh, food law. And, 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 and it starts with this premise that eating is more, satisfying, is more than just satisfying a physiological need. Culture matters. It does matter. And what we think about food matters. Um, I remember um, I was in the law office of the in London of the attorney who got the call. I was actually there present when she got the call about the horse meat scandal in, in the UK. And she told me I'd read about it in the newspaper the next day, and sure enough, I did. Um, I was also in China attending a food safety conference, and my interpreter was interpreting what was being said, and it was in preparation for the Olympics. And the food safety authorities were telling the local restauranteurs in Shanghai, no dog meat is to be served. If you serve it, you'll be shut down and you'll go to jail. Now after the Olympics, you can do whatever you want. That's not what they said, but that was the implicit, that was the inference. But it's, it's interesting how culture 
and what we think about food matters in, in two very sort of severe, stark ways. Um, governance is shaped by cultural, political, and social, uh, sociological norms that is intensifi intensified by this uh, food movement. And, and it ranges from sustainability uh, and access to healthy food, localness, uh, the right to information, the treatment of animals, the monoculture of these large uh, farms and, and producers and manufacturers, food justice and equity, and food security. We have on our staff at UCLA uh, uh, Dr. Halel Elver, who is the Right to Food Special Rapporteur for the United Nations. And uh, she's also received her SJD at UCLA, which, which, which was helpful in our persuading her to set up shop with us. But she travels around the world talking about the right to food. And again, what do we think about food? I ask my students, is there a right to food? And most of them will say, well, sure there is. But under the US constitutional construct, we're a country of negative rights, not positive rights. And the United States does not recognize a, a, a right to food within its constitution. What's fascinating about this is that China, in its 2015 Food Safety Act, recognizes that there's an, ex there's an express right to know <laughs> in its constitution. And, and who would have ever thought that, that, that the world would be set up the way it is in terms of food and the right to know and the right to food, or, and the right to, uh, right to know and the right to food. Now, this vastness of food law, the regulation, uh, at least in the United States, the federal, the state, you have provincial issues or issues of province jurisdiction here in Canada, uh, municipal uh, as well. Most of the, the, the advances in food law, progressive food legislation in the United States has happened at the municipal level, the city level, from trans fat to, to menu labeling uh, to a number of, of, of uh, of, of laws that relate to food have happened at the city level. The international complexities of food. <clears throat> How many of you have heard of ractopamine by raise of hand? All right, one of you, excellent. Well, how many of you eat turkeys? You don't have to raise your hands if you don't want to. But ractopamine is a drug that's used in animals that has been a, a huge international dispute. And it's fascinating because it, it, it brings into play, again, China in, in, in a juxtaposition to the United States and to Europe, where the ractopamine causes the animals to be very aggressive at the end of their life, which leads to some interesting animal rights and animal welfare issues. But there's also a safety issue. And Europe, in using the precautionary principle, was, is very much against the use of ractopamine in animals the United States was very frustrated because it couldn't get approvals at the level of Codex Alimentarius Commission, the commission that gives approvals that are then used as a benchmark for international trade disputes. A vote was forced. The U.S. won by one vote, 51 to 50. The question was, is this, is this a good way to make science? Now, what was interesting about this vote was that China en ended up entering into the fray. And even though there was a vote in favor of the U.S. position, China said, no, we're not going to accept any animal byproducts that have been from animals that have been fed this animal drug of, of ractopamine. Why? Because the human studies of consumers in the United States that were used, the, 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 the consumers ate every part of the animal except for one really important part that Chinese consumers eat, the, animal, the organs of the animal. And so the Chinese discounted the studies. And so you have a food safety issue layered on top of an animal welfare issue to just show you the complexities of these issues, uh, both on an international level as well as national level. And then, of course, litigation. Uh, and, and, and that's uh, uh, certainly uh, an issue in and of itself in, in the United States. And your Canadian system is different, but I think there is some borrowing that goes on in terms of at least looking at the U.S. as an example with respect to class action. The other area, new governance, which is really interesting, self-regulation, which is not really, it's a, it's a bit of a misnomer that it's voluntary. Oftentimes, corporations and food companies will self-regulate because they see what's coming ahead. For example, in the United States, the front of pack labeling. Front of pack labeling was first introduced in the, United, in the UK 
as a way of putting the essential information on the front of packages with a really nifty color scheme. And, and it was introduced and in in it frightened to death the American and the U.S. Manufacturers, food manufacturers because they saw that perhaps coming to the United States. And so as a preemptive measure, the industry developed its own front of pack labeling. And this is called self-regulation. The only thing is it led to some absurd results with products like sugary cereal, cereals such as uh, Frosted Flakes or Fruit Loops, I don't remember which one, that ended up getting a positive check on the health list. Uh, and it got a, a positive reference on the front of pack labeling. And, and there's been a tug of war since then about who's going to regulate in this area. Is it going to be the industry? Is it going to be the FDA? Regulatory bodies move very slowly, but they move slowly for a reason, because they need to vet. They need to work through the issues. There's a, a great deal of public comment. There's also the, the natural uh, problems of bureaucracy. But it is interesting to see this interplay between private industry initiatives uh, and, uh, re and regulation. Uh, and that includes uh, these private standards of which I spoke, spoke about earlier. To give you an interesting example, my mother uh, married, uh, my stepfather's from Lima, Peru. And so I oftentimes would uh, go down to Peru and visit <clears throat> my mother and, and my stepfather lived down there for a number of years. And I became friends with the president of uh, Lima's largest law firm in, in uh, and he owned a farm in Ica, Peru. Anyone ever been to Ica, Peru? <laughs> okay. And he, he dreamt, dreamt of, of, of growing this asparagus farm that would be uh, the largest in the world and it was irrigated by well water. And it was a really, it's a fascinating place to visit. And I would go down there and, and we would ride horses and we would do all sorts of fun things and I used to love to talk to the farm workers. In fact, I remember uh, my daughter who was fluent in Spanish, she was my translator, we went out and spoke to the farm workers. Having grown up on a farm, I was always interested in the, in the efficiency of the, the work. And the question was asked, well, what is Thanksgiving? And the reason that question was asked because at Thanksgiving in the United States, that's when the greatest demand for asparagus uh, occurred and then all of the farm workers in the community would have to come out and work. I, 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 so every time at Thanksgiving if I eat asparagus I think about this experience in Ica. Well this, I went to the manufacturing plant in this farm and they would fly the asparagus to the United States or to Europe uh, during their harvest. And the plant was really dirty and dismal, it was dark, there was no light. I remember going into the bathroom, I couldn't find a light. And I only had cold water and I couldn't find soap and I had to use a dirty towel. I, and I always remember that because it struck me that this is very different than food manufacturing facilities that I had encountered in the United States and elsewhere as I've traveled the world. About four years after that first time I went to the farm, I was in Washington, D.C. And there was a certification company uh, from, from Australia that was introducing the concept of private certification as a way to regulate food. And he had a PowerPoint, and guess what that PowerPoint was all about? This particular asparagus farm in Ica, Peru. I couldn't believe it. And he showed the pictures of the farm before, and he showed the pictures of the farm after, and the processing facilities. Clean, sparkling, white clothes, lights working, hot water, clean towels, HACCP, um, and other food safety processes that were followed uh, in the system. And it was amazing to see the contrast. The retailers in Europe had demanded through private standards and private contracts that this operation clean up its act in order to keep shipping and sending food to Europe. Now, sounds like a great idea, doesn't it? But it's interesting to note that developing countries around the world were very concerned about this development and in fact had threatened for a number of years to file a complaint with the World Trade Organization over the use of these private standards and these contracts because it was a way of regulating food outside of the normal regulatory channels. And who was suffering? Well, the small farmers who couldn't afford to capitalize. And so when we talk about regulation, there's what I call the law of unintended consequences. 
And here was a really interesting unintended consequence from a good idea and something that was leading to a good result. And, and so we see the complications of private standards are, are, are really, really interesting in third party certification. Um, but in this world of food law, we have an expanded audience. We have the FDA legal bar, um, trial lawyers, government counsel, uh, advocacy groups, the legal academy, policymakers. Most of you probably fit into one of these categories. What we now have is this, this dynamic growth of all these com complex issues, and we end up with the academy, law schools. Um, as mentioned, we have our program at UCLA. Um, right after we started our program, there's a program at Harvard Law School that started. At UCLA, we also have created a, cl a law clinic. Uh, a clinic will be a live policy clinic that will service, that will have students who get credit at UCLA Law School uh, and represent live policy clients uh, with faculty that we've hired. Um, Food law and policy, or some version of it, is being taught now over 30 law schools. Just last year, uh, Yale Law School had its first class. New York University had its first class. Um, and um, Seattle, um, and a number of other law schools. What was interesting about New York University is the, is the and this is a case where, this is really a student movement. Um, the students had formed a student food law association at NYU. And, and uh, the student leader told me this personally, that they had an event, and it was the event that attracted the largest amount of participants of any law school event had in the last five years. And that's what caught the dean's attention. And, and now there's a very um, respected torts professor who's going to teach a food law class because of the student demand at the law school. Uh, it, it was uh, another interesting uh, side story is a few months ago uh, there's a high school in Los Angeles called Santa Monica High School and it's a lovely little high school my daughter went there it's right up by the beach had I gone there I would have never graduated from high school but somehow she got through it and and I and every year they invite a law the law students at UCLA to teach a law class and so the, the, the law school put together a list of 12 to 15 different topics and I went to the class because one of my students was teaching food law. And I encountered the, the teacher who was running this program, and he said it's interesting that, that food law was the unanimous pick of all of the students who voted. And, and criminal law came in second, and every previous year criminal law was always number one. And I sat through the class, and then I listened to the students. And I was amazed at the sophistication and the curiosity of these students in talking about food systems. And I, I, w I went back to my office thinking, this is a generational issue. And, and where this goes will depend on people who are a lot younger than me. Uh, uh, and it's, it's really uh, fascinating to watch. So, and then the international growth. I've told you already about Asia. Uh, the interesting thing about Reming University in China is because of its, it's the most respected law school in China, it's attracting attention from all over Asia, from uh, Japan to, um, to Thailand and, and Vietnam, and, and there's professors from all these different Asian countries now learning about food law through this law school in China. So, this vastness of food law, I think, raises a, a, an interesting question, and a fair question. Is it, is it a discipline in and of itself, or is it a subsection of other forms of law? Can we call it food law? And I, I, I reminded myself to come back to this question when I wrote the treatise, because I think it's an important question to ask. And, and I, I think that, that the answer I came up with is that, yes, it is a discipline, and its value lies in, in its focus on how the law governs the food from the seed to the table. In other words, this modern food system has a unique set of issues and problems, and it warrants a legal field that facilitates improvements, much like we did with environmental law. It also has a framework, which is overlooked by a lot of well-meaning scholars, 
all the way back to 1906, the Pure Food and Drug Act, and even prior to that, I would submit. But it has a legal framework up, upon which to draw. And what I would like to do in the last remaining time of my presentation and during our Q&A, if you're interested in going that direction, is to, is to ponder uh, the trajectory of this movement, this food law movement, and, and whether this expanded field of food law uh, is coherent, distinctive enough to evolve into some permanent uh, discipline. And, and, the, and, and I think that, that time will only tell. Uh, and to think about the growth of food law in the uh, academy and in private practice and its further adaptation. Let me make just a few more observations. Uh, first of all, with respect to private practice. When I left the University of Arkansas School of Law, I realized that in order for me to really understand food law, I needed to practice. And so I went to a law firm, the Venable Law Firm in Washington, D.C., who had a, a very vibrant food and drug law practice. But I convinced the law firm that, that my food law practice and the practice of a partner who had joined me uh, on this venture, who, who had been general counsel to the Department of Agriculture, was different. And we were focused more on food systems. And I think perhaps our enthusiasm outweighed the glassiness that I saw in their eyes as they listened to us try to distinguish between the two. But we ended up developing an interesting practice. And, and it included parts of FDA law, but also bigger parts of, it, of food law as well, as we found our rep ourselves representing retailers and Indian mango farmers who wanted to export food and their mangoes into the United States, and food companies trying to set up business in Shanghai, China. And so the, the, the work was interesting and diverse. Recently, I had attend my class, a lawyer from the law firm of Davis Wright and Termaine, I think is the last name, a very large law firm based in Seattle. They have offices uh, throughout the United States, about 600 lawyers. She told me they have 40 food law lawyers in their law firm. It's an industry-based practice. And I think in, in, in talking to, and, I, and, I, and I, I, sp I speak to a number of large law firms in the United States and, and, and friends practicing law, food law in, in these organizations. And what we're seeing is this shift from practice focus to industry focus, which bodes very well for a food law practitioner. And so you have in these large law firms somebody who's a patent lawyer, an intellectual property lawyer, calling themselves a food law lawyer because they represent food companies for the most part. And because their issues are, are unique. And so uh, the private practice is, is, is fascinating to watch the acceptance and the, and, the, and, the, and the development of food law. There's an organization just had a meeting in Budapest in, in, in Europe that's uh, formed of mostly practitioners around Europe uh, that are now engaged in food law. The European Food Law Association is comprised of mostly of practitioners who share information with each other and represent food companies. And so it's, it's changing. Even the big accounting firms, Deloitte and others, who, have, were, who got into the business through the Food Safety Modernization Act, um, are now have hired lawyers uh, to, to, to work on food policy issues and representing their clients. And so, and, and the other area that I think is really, really interesting that I encourage my students to think about are emerging food companies and new technologies. We have convened at our law school at UCLA three different stakeholder meetings of, of various uh, groups that are involved in new emerging food companies. And, and I think there's a lot of work to be done. And they have legal needs that are really interesting. The new economy, the alternative economy is, is fascinating to watch. And so there's a lot of areas uh, for, for development of private practice in addition to law schools. But I think working together is really important because food law is in and of itself is an applied law. And in, in order to have a, a, an, an academic legitimacy, uh, we've got to be interdisciplinary and also uh, intersectional with uh, private practitioners. So I'll leave it at that. And if anything else, I've hopefully I've been able to communicate to you the, the uh, complexities of food law as well as the dynam its dynamic growth uh, around the world. And I congratulate you for thinking about this in China and wish you well and hope to, to watch your progress over time. Thank you.
So we're open to questions, and, and Jamie's going to help me kind of feel, arbitrate. Uh, I'm going to just going to moderate quickly um, uh, or briefly. Uh, uh, we are a little bit limited in time, so uh, for those of you who do have questions, I'll today come to the microphones uh, up to the front, and, and please, uh, in the interest of both time and, and fairness, to keep your questions uh, very brief, and, and, and hopefully we'll be able to take about 10 minutes um, and, and, and address your questions for, for Michael. So I'll start over here on my right. Uh, thank you. I just want to follow up on your kind of conclusion about the role of academy in food law and policy. And so I'm wondering, this conference is a kind of, we bring together practitioners and law schools. Right. And law schools train practitioners but also have conversations within academy. And I'm just wondering where you see food law and policy having those academic conversations because as you mentioned, a constitutional lawyer who's working on food issues they speak to other constitutional scholars with kind of a shared understanding of what framework they're working in, same for property lawyers, right. same for tax lawyers, but who do the food law scholars talk to inside kind of the legal academy? Because they can talk to geographers or political scientists, talk about food, and so I'm just wondering how the academic field gets built up. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and, and this laboratory that we're involved in at UCLA is, is sort of answering your question as we go day by day. Um, it, it, it was difficult at first for us at UCLA to identify who are the scholars, for example, at the law school that, that have an affinity with us, and, and over time, we've been able to win a lot of people over. And so, for example, at our, our marketing conference, we had a great constitutional scholar, Eugene Bullock, who gave a talk on on First Amendment issues and food law, uh, or food marketing. And, and so it, it depends on the issue. We have folks who, are involved, who teach health law at UCLA who are very involved with us now. The a animal uh, rights program, um, the director of that program who's a professor is now working closely with us on issues of animal law and food. Um, uh, the environmental law program works very closely with us. Uh, the civil rights, the human rights, we're actually co-sponsoring a program when I get back on the 12th that will look at prison food and, and issues related to food in prison, both in terms of safety and nutrition, uh, that's being co-sponsored by us in the civil rights program at UCLA. So it's actually now becoming almost a problem <laughs> where at first we had a dearth of faculty interest and now we have to, almost too much. Uh, in the sense that we, it's, it, we're, we're really being called into various aspects. I think it's a matter of just time. And again, it's, it's, a, it's a model that, that reflects, uh, again, a, a multi-doctrinal approach to a, a, a problem. The expertise we bring to the table is our understanding of the food system and how all of this works in context with the food system. And I think that's unique. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Bill Jeffrey from the Center for Health Science and Law. Um, I wonder if you could comment on uh, the interplay between kind of academic style research and um, food law reform, three examples in, in which uh, the American Academy has actually affected policy in other countries. Um, one is uh, TransFAT, um, around 2000, the U.S. Institute of Medicine, that's what it was called then, uh, published a report on TransFAT, and that almost immediately led to a ban on TransFAT in Denmark, and I guess we'll see something eventually in, in the United States and Canada, but, you know, a decade, decade and a half later. Um, likewise, the Federal Trade Commission report that you referred to uh, on advertising directed at children, um, the result of that in the United States was that it kind of impeded the ability of the Federal Trade Commission to act in that area in the future, but an almost immediate impact was it led to um, a ban on advertising directed to children in Quebec, and in fact, that staff report was used to defend the Quebec law in the Supreme Court of Canada and successfully. Hmm. Interesting. And then the, the, um, the last example, um, I guess it's more um, germane uh, these days, is um, U.S. academic literature in a bunch of different disciplines, uh, law and economics particularly, but also public health. Um, about putting a tax on sugar-sweetened beverages. Yeah. It's interesting because I think the United States is maybe the only country in the world that doesn't have a, uh, a national sales tax, mm -hmm. and almost every other country taxes food in some way. Um, but there's this, like, an obsession about just taxing sugar-sweetened beverages in the, uh, I think, in the mass media anyway now, and I'm just interested in your thoughts. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and I think... The, the answer to the question is that there is definitely a role, uh, and I think that what the, the law can actually not only take a leadership role, but also um, 
a, a role that adds some maturity to the debate as well. So for example, take, take taxation um, or any other legal remedy as it relates to sugar, su sugar sweetened beverages. Uh, the question that, that I always have is, is will it change behavior? Um, and w will, will taxation be effective? Uh, so we, I think that allowing for social behavior science and uh, to, to mature and develop over time will lead to better laws and better policies. Um, but I think that the role of law is to help arbitrate the, the conflicts. So when it comes to the constitutional issues or First Amendment issues in the United States, uh, having lawyers who are firmly committed to free speech understand the complexities of what's going on. So for example, we think of advertising strictly in terms of television advertising historically when it comes to FTC regulation. But if we look at social media, what's going on in gaming, what's going on in YouTube with advertising, it's really, it's, it's really quite incredible. And that's where a lot of the advertising dollars are being spent now anyway. It changes the facts. And, and, and for First Amendment scholars to know about this, it's up to the food law bar, I think, to communicate that and to ask, you know, where do we go? What do we do with this new information? Does this change or color the views of constitutional scholars who have looked at these issues for a number of years. Um, another example is uh, antibiotics, antibiotic resistance in feeding animal drugs to animals. Um, we had a conference, our conference last year in Cambridge at Harvard uh, addressed this issue. And we've been writing about this. In fact, we're publishing in the UCLA Law Review an article on antibiotic restrictions. And it just so happens that California now has a new law, but one of the fundamental legal questions is one of preemption. You know, what is the role of states and local municipalities in regulating in this area? So I think there's a, there's this, a tremendous need for, for lawyers uh, in this field uh, to step up, and hopefully the Food Law Bar uh, offers that opportunity so we can work with both scientists and policymakers. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, we got time for one more question, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave the last question uh, here to the mic. Thanks. Thank you for a truly remarkable talk. So one comment, you were talking about the vastness of food law, which made me think of the same vastness in my field of health law. The uh, sub um, themes such as uh, the intersection of criminal law, tort law, administrative law. And it seems to me that this is a feature of laws that are crafted around a subject matter. So now to two questions. You're talking about the growth of food law as a discipline. And this makes me think about, I'd like to ask you two questions. One question is, what do you think are the main reason why food law is growing as a discipline? The second question is, why now? Is, is what now? Why now? Oh, why now? Well, I think, the why, let me address the why now question first, I guess. Um, well, both at the same time. The, 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 it's the problems, the problems that we're facing. Uh, in, I mean, we just, o obesity, for example. Um, it's a serious problem, caught the attention of, of policymakers, military leaders, educators. What causes this problem? Well, it's in large part due to a food system that's generating a lot of food that makes us gain weight. Uh, and, and that has led to, uh, um, has sort of nicely dovetailed into a food movement that was mainly part of that, but also independent of that. And it was really, you know, the writings of Michael Pollan and, 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 and before him, there were also philosophers who were writing about food. And so I think the, the other, it's not necessarily, it's why now is because of, of the food movement and the problems of the food system. And, and what's interesting to me is that this discussion has been going on a long time, but now it's being recognized uh, by, by others. Your prime minister who's calling for a food policy. Um, and and it, it's also, uh, in going back to the previous question, um, we have on our, our board uh, a fellow who was in the White House um, and uh, the nutrition advisor to President Obama. And he has told us that the question he would ask at the White House and that he heard asked at the White House is, where are the lawyers? In other words, the environmental law, move, the environmental movement was led by lawyers. Uh, 
the food movement, where are the lawyers? <laughs> and one of the reasons for having, not having lawyers necessarily engaged in the United States is that the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, the 1938 Act, does not allow for a private cause of action, which you have under the environmental statutes in the United States. So that is one fundamental difference. But another difference is just that the law just isn't, hasn't reacted fast enough. And, and so this, this movement is, is, is a value-based movement, but it's also based on problems that are really complicated. And I think that's another problem that the law has is that how do you solve these problems by law? And, and, and maybe we can't, but maybe the law can be used as a tool to move the needle and to help generate is, issues and generate interest. As I tell my students, it's, you're not just going to be lawyers, you're going to be leaders. And, and lawyers are, are naturally, not all, not all the time, but naturally fall into the leadership category because they're articulate, they think, we train them, we train them to analyze. So we need thoughtful people because these problems are not simple. They're complicated. We didn't wake up with an industrial food complex overnight, and we're not going to get rid of it. And even organic food, I mean, my good heavens, when I grew up on our small farm, an organic food store used to buy our produce. We sprayed our produce when I was a kid. We didn't know any better. And, and then we have the Organic Food Act in the United States, and every country now has a food act, but it was seen as local food. Now we have treaties. There are treaties between countries that regulate organic food. The United States and Europe has a treaty. Can, uh, China wants in on the action. Everyone has a treaty when it comes to organic food. It's an international trade issue now. And so the complexities of food uh, really sort of rise to the point where it makes it difficult, but even more important for lawyers to be involved. Sorry, I went off on a tangent, but uh, great question. I hope I answered it. <laughs> In the interest of our time, I'm going to have to wrap it up there. I'm sure uh, uh, it is someone with regret we could we could talk about this uh, at length, and hope we will. Uh, that is to say, please stay tuned and stay connected. Um, uh, we'll be in touch certainly about things that come out of this conference. Please join me uh, in thanking Michael for coming all this way to Halifax and really sharing. This